Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. It's time once again to journey into the world of professional wrestling movies. I will not blame you if you run away screaming. Of course, the last time I journeyed into this dark place was when I reviewed No Holds Barred, which you can't watch on YouTube because WWE had it taken down. But I'm not bitter. Really? The movie was co-produced by what was then known as the World Wrestling Federation and starred Hulk Hogan as, well, himself really, and Tiny Lister as... So... And it was terrible. Obviously. But it was also hilarious. They tried so hard and failed so spectacularly that I couldn't help but be entertained. It's a classic So Bad It's Good movie. And if that's your thing, I totally recommend it. <laughs> but I'm not sure if I can say the same for the subject of today's review, which comes to us courtesy of WWE's now defunct competition, World Championship Wrestling. Ready to rumble. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, ready to ru- Nah, fuck it. This mess of a film was directed by Brian Robbins, who also directed A Thousand Words, just to give you an idea of what we're in for, and stars David Arquette, to give you a further idea of what we're in for. Ready to Rumble was the brainchild of former WCW president Eric Bischoff, who brokered a deal back in 1997, when WCW was making money hand over fist, to essentially create a WCW movie. But they didn't actually start filming until two years later, and by that time the company was losing money and getting consistently spanked by WWF in the ratings. But the powers that be in WCW were hopeful the movie would help the business by giving them some mainstream attention. Spoiler alert, it didn't. Filming began in October of 1999, and the movie hit theaters five months later in April of 2000. Even Planet of the Apes wasn't that rushed. But then, the company was in a downward spiral, and if they didn't hurry, they could very well be out of business by the time the movie was finished. Okay, I exaggerate a bit, but things were seriously not looking good for WCW around this time. And speaking of not looking good, let's talk about the movie. Our heroes... no. Our losers for this story are Jordy and Sean, played respectively by David Arquette and Scott Kahn. And yes, I am embarrassed to share a name with one of these characters. Jordy and Sean live in BFE Wyoming and make a living sucking shit out of porta potties. They spend their free time obsessing over WCW and sticking their fingers in their asses. Hey, Gordy. No, really. One of the first things we see in this movie is Jordy sticking his finger up his ass so he can shove it in the face of a convenience store clerk and fool him into thinking the smell is coming from his Slurpee so he can get a free refill. This is bad comedy. This is our introduction to this character. Not only is it disgusting, but it's basically ripping off the stink palm from Mallrats. So it's bad and unoriginal. He's also a major dick to his friend Sean, just in case you thought this character might be the least bit sympathetic. Oh lord no! While they're on the job, Sean goes to take a dump in one of the freshly cleaned porta potties I don't know why he didn't do that before they cleaned them, but oh well. And Jordy takes this opportunity to hook up the suction. How are you the hero of this story, you stupid douche nozzle? Was this really supposed to be funny? Because it's not. It's just mean. Jordy's dad is a cop and a bit of a hard ass and would like very much for his son to stop wasting his life sucking shit and forcing people to smell his and join the police force. And I can understand wanting your son to have a more promising career than shit sucker, but do you really want a guy like this to carry a gun? Think this through, dad. Think this through. And he'd like his son to quit watching that stupid wrestling already, because it's clearly frying his brain. Wrestling's fake. Wrestling's not fake! Okay, someone needs to lay off the Slurpees. Also, this. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> now, here's the thing. I agree with Jordy's words, though not the meaning behind them. Because wrestling is not fake. Oh sure, the storylines are scripted, the moves are choreographed, the match outcomes are predetermined. Duh, of course they are. But the word fake 
implies that it doesn't hurt, and that is clearly not the case. The men and women who participate in professional wrestling put their bodies through an insane amount of punishment and are pretty much in constant pain because of it. I think Lance Storm once said, when asked what his pain level was like on a scale of 1 to 10, that a day off at home typically results in a nice relaxing 4. And that's not even taking into account the numerous injuries, broken bones, torn muscles, concussions, and on extremely rare occasions, paralysis, and even death. And that's why I do not call it fake. Wrestling isn't real, per se, but it ain't ballet. But when Jordy says, Wrestling's not fake! Mmm. I am not playing that again. When Jordy says wrestling's not fake, he totally believes it. Jordy is what is known in the wrestling business as a mark. A mark is someone who believes everything that happens in professional wrestling is 100% legit. Someone who has a huge and unhealthy obsession with all things wrestling, and, according to Brian Pillman, someone who thinks OJ didn't do it. I miss Brian Pillman. And Jordy definitely has an unhealthy obsession. In the opening moments of this movie, shortly before he sticks his finger in his ass, his Slurpee apparently gives him a massive brain freeze which causes him to hallucinate a wrestling match with the clerk in the middle of the convenience store that somehow involves a Randy Savage cameo and Jordy intentionally slamming his head through a glass freezer door. Seemed like a good idea at the time. This is apparently how the powers that be in WCW saw wrestling fans. This is how they saw their fans. A bunch of near brain dead marks. That's fucking insulting. And check out this shot. Jordy and Sean sitting on the back of their truck while shit slowly drips out the back. There's a metaphor in there somewhere, and it ain't good. I can't believe how much we suck! You're telling me. This is a wrestling movie through and through, so one would think wrestling fans would be the obvious target audience. And yet this movie takes every opportunity to insult that very audience. I wonder if this is what comic book fans feel like. So we've talked a lot about Jordy. What about Sean? Well, he's pretty clearly the sidekick in this relationship, so there's not much to tell. If he does have a family to speak of, we never meet them or even hear about them. Really, all we know is he has a crush on this girl who works at the fast food drive-thru, while this other girl who also works at the fast food drive-thru has a crush on him. So there's a love triangle involving a shit sucker and two burger flippers. It is a small town. Leave me alone. Loser! Would a loser have two tickets to Monday Night Nitro live from Cheyenne tonight? Yes. Uh. And they have no comeback for that. Did WCW hate its fans this much? I know Vince Russo was running the company around this time, and I just answered my own question. Also, the show wasn't called Monday Night Nitro. It was just Monday Nitro. The show with Night in its name was WWF's show, Monday Night Raw. Wait a minute. Monday Night Raw, Monday Night Pro. Oh my god, I just got that. So given that this is a movie about late 90s WCW, you might expect the arena to have better lighting than this, and you might expect Jordy and Sean's favorite wrestler would be someone like Goldberg, or Sting, or Ric Flair, or even Hulk Hogan. And you'd be wrong. Hell, Flair and Hogan aren't even in this movie because they clearly had better things to do. No, their favorite wrestler of all time is Jimmy King, played by Oliver Platt. Yeah, they actually had to create a fictional WCW World Heavyweight Champion for this movie, while still displaying their complete lack of originality. He's clearly a ripoff of Jerry the King Lawler. Royalty gimmick, southern accent, hell, they even gave him similar sounding entrance music. But instead of Mussorgsky's Great Gate of Kiev, it's Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man. Which seems like a contradiction. King, Common Man, which one are you, dude? And I love Oliver Platt, really I do, but I do not believe for one second that this guy is a professional wrestler. And he's not. Actual WCW wrestler Chris Canyon was his stunt double. And if you're curious, David Arquette's stunt double was Shane Helms. Scott Kahn did his own stunts. Good for him.
But yeah, this is apparently the star of the company. He's out of shape, sneers at everyone, and has a holier-than-thou attitude. And yet he's supposed to be a fan favorite. No wonder WCW went out of business. Oh, did I mention he raps? Because nothing puts butts in the seats like the freestylings of a fat middle-aged white man. I'm the king of rock. There is none high. Sucker MCs call me side. If you're the king of rock, why are you rapping? Also, why are you coming to the ring to Copeland? Also, why? Just all of this. Just why? But while the fans love him, for some reason, the evil WCW Booker does not because King is out of shape and has a huge ego and is constantly showing up late for TV. That is totally understandable. Why is this guy the villain? This is Titus Sinclair, played by Joe Pantoliano, who looks like the illegitimate love child of Cyrus from ECW and Shawn Michaels. Fun fact, this character was originally supposed to be Eric Bischoff playing a fictional version of himself, but he was fired from WCW before filming started. It's too bad, really. I honestly think he would have been a much better fit for this role. And the movie was his idea. Anyway, tonight's main event for... Monday Night Nitro is Jimmy King defending the WCW world title against Diamond Dallas Page. And for some reason, Mean Gene Okerlund is the ring announcer, even though that wasn't his normal job. I guess there just wasn't enough money in the budget for David Penzer. For those of you who know your wrestling history, there's a hilarious moment backstage where Page asks Titus for the finish of his match. He'll pile drive you, get up on the ropes, and that crown he's gonna get the win. Whatever. Works right. for me, I'll tell the king. Okay. Thanks. Now, for most wrestlers, that would be enough. While they, of course, plan the finish and maybe a couple of big spots ahead of time, for the most part, when they're in the ring, they just kind of wing it and call spots as they go. In fact, we get to see a bit of that during the match, which I thought was a nice touch. <laughs> Give me tackle. <laughs> but here's the thing about Diamond Dallas Page. Unlike most wrestlers, that man was notorious for having to plan out all of his matches ahead of time, move for move. Every suplex, every headlock, every body slam, everything bell to bell. But in Ready to Rumble, all he needs is the finish. I'm sure this doesn't amuse most of you as much as it amuses me, but you know what? This is my show and I'll make fun of whatever I want, so... <laughs> But anyway, it turns out DDP and Titus are in cahoots and plan to get rid of Jimmy King once and for all. So midway through the match, DDP suddenly starts shooting on him. For those of you who aren't wrestling fans, shooting is another way of saying breaking from the script or fighting for real. This has been another useless fact. And here's where the movie gets stupid. Er. At this point, DDP is now legitimately trying to hurt King, and we are supposed to believe that they are now fighting for really reals. But then this happens. Oh, like he broke the table. Oh. DDP catapults King over the top rope and through a table on the outside. Why that table was there in the first place, I have no idea, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, the catapult is probably the silliest move in professional wrestling. As wrestling fans, we know this, we accept this, and we just kind of go along with it. And obviously, it would never work in a real fight. Like many pro wrestling moves, the only way the catapult works is if your opponent jumps into it, which King clearly does in this shot. Again, WCW must think its fans are really stupid if they expect us to buy this. Anyway, King fights back with a chair. This is not a disqualification. And a low blow. This is also not a disqualification. But then DDP's buddies come to the ring and put the boots to Jimmy. Okay, was this supposed to be a no DQ match? Because it was never announced as such. And check out DDP's random ass stable. Sid Vicious, Van Hammer, Bam Bam Bigelow, Prince Iakea, and Juventud Guerrera. Who are they supposed to be? The NW No? But then King's equally random ass stable, consisting of Perry Saturn, Kurt Hennig, and Conan, come out to save him. Oh, wait, no, it's a swerve. 
Fun fact, by the time this movie hit theaters, Perry Saturn had already jumped to the WWF. So WCW accidentally featured a WWF wrestler in their movie. Oops. And then they hit something called a Four Post Massacre, which doesn't actually exist. Mainly because it would be very difficult to pull off without hurting someone. Probably yourself. And DDP wins the title and King is sent packing. Why? Why not? Why not? You screwed him over just for the hell of it? I can think of worse reasons. As you might expect, Jordy and Sean are horribly distraught by this turn of events, so much so that they accidentally crash their shitmobile, which starts spilling shit all over the highway. Again, there's a metaphor in there somewhere. And then another truck comes along and crashes into the shitmobile despite having a good 500 yards to stop, causing toilet paper to fly everywhere. Whoa. What are the odds of that? A lame joke in this stupid ass movie? I'd say the odds are pretty high. Anyway, the Marks decide this is a sign from God or something, and they have to track down Jimmy King and get him his title back. Because again, they think wrestling is real. Although in this case, I guess it kind of was... Whatever, you get my point. And they get some help from the Shermanator who tracks down the King with his leet computer hacking skills and his Apple iBook G3. Oh dear lord, no. You ain't hacking shit with an iBook, son. And here's the real kicker. He gets all of his information on Jimmy King, including his home address, from Jimmy King's official website. That's not hacking. That's just web browsing. The Sandra Bullock movie The Net understood hacking better than Ready to Rumble. Well, they eventually find the king living in a trailer park and impersonating a woman to hide from the IRS or something, I don't know. And this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. WCW paid its talent pretty well back then, and many of their wrestlers, especially the main eventers, had guaranteed contracts backed by WCW's parent company, AOL Time Warner. That's why so many people jumped ship from WWF back in the day. The money was too good. So even if they're sitting at home, as King is here, as long as they have a contract, they're still getting paid. So why is this asshole living in a trailer park? Anyway, King tries to convince these fucking marks that he's not at all what they think he is and wrestling is all a show, etc, etc, but they're not buying it because they're fucking marks. How can you be phony if we believe in you? That's because you're morons. The fuck are they putting in the water in Wyoming? This leads to our losers smuggling King into a WCW show in a porta potty because everything in this movie is shit. I'm not sure why they have all these porta potties. They're in a major sports arena. Surely they have restrooms. While King lies in wait, our losers take the opportunity to peep into the Nitro Girls locker room while they're changing. Now I know what you're thinking. That's a little creepy. Well, let me just assure you, it gets worse. Jordy ends up getting romantically involved with the head Nitro Girl Sasha, played by Rose McGowan, just go with it, and their relationship is... well... FOREIGN OBJECTS! <laughs> and then they made sweet, sweet love. I'm not kidding. He punches her in the face, and then they have sex. I know the word problematic is a bit overused nowadays, but Jesus, what were they thinking? Anyway, back to Jimmy King. He springs from his hiding place and he and DDP brawl amongst the toilets. Is anyone else having flashbacks to Randy Savage and Dennis Rodman? Oh yeah, that happened. Look it up. King ends up pinning DDP and the referee counts three, even though as Titus rightly points out, that was not a sanctioned match. You can't just show up backstage and pin someone for the world title, you idiots. But Titus offers King a real world title match at the upcoming pay-per-view and will even throw in a million dollars if he wins. Pardon me for asking the obvious question here, but why? Titus has made it perfectly clear that he hates King with a passion and he really has no reason to give him anything. 
but King shows up unannounced to one TV taping and starts one backstage fight, and all of a sudden Titus is like, here, have a world title shot and some money. This makes no sense. It really is a WCW movie. Well, once King secures his title shot, Tweedledee and Tweedledum here decide he needs a trainer to get him back in ring shape, obviously. So they bring him to Sal Bandini, played by Martin Landau. Sal Bandini, wanna wrestle? Sal is basically this movie's version of Stu Hart, an older gentleman whose best days are clearly behind him, but he can still twist your ass into a pretzel. And this is one of the few sequences in this movie that's actually not half bad, mostly because Landau is awesome and even he can't be dragged down by this movie. May he rest in peace. So after some more terrible comedy and a John Cena cameo, before anyone knew who he was, and the shocking revelation that Sasha was working for Titus the whole time, a revelation that goes absolutely nowhere, by the way, it's time for the main event, which will take place inside the triple cage. Three steel cages of different sizes stacked on top of each other. And I can't lie, it looks pretty damn awesome. And here's how the triple cage match works. The title is hung above the top cage, and both wrestlers start in the lower cage. The goal is to use a ladder to climb up through a trap door that leads into the second cage, in which there are weapons, by the way, and then you exit through the door of the second cage, climb the outer structure to the top of the third cage, grab the belts, and you win. It is the most ridiculous thing ever, and I love it. Granted, it's not the most original idea. It appears to at least be loosely based on the Tower of Doom that first appeared at the 1988 Great American Bash for Jim Crockett Promotions, a precursor to WCW. Though in that match, you started in the top cage and worked your way down. So basically, it's a Tower of Doom in reverse. And given the overall quality of this movie, it's more like a Tower of Dumb. And of course the heels once again gang up on King, but King has enlisted some help as well. And this time, it's not a swerve. It is, however, another seemingly random group of wrestlers. Goldberg, Booker T, Billy Kidman, and Disco Inferno. Yes, WCW once had a wrestler called Disco Inferno. In the late 90s. Wrestling is weird. Jordy and Sean help out as well, because of course, so does Sting, who swings in like he's fucking Tarzan and kicks DDP off the top cage before he can grab the belt. The one thing that would redeem this movie for me right now would be if Sting just grabbed the belt and took it for himself. Sadly, we're not gonna get that lucky. In the end, King slams DDP on the uppermost cage and he falls through the entire structure, landing in the ring with a sickening thud. So he's dead. Also, way to rip off King of the Ring 98. And King is the world champion once again, despite Titus's protests and his insistence that he made wrestling, damn it! The people, the fans made wrestling! Oh, fuck you! You just spent about a hundred minutes shitting all over wrestling fans, sometimes literally, and now you want to pander? God, this movie is terrible. And unlike No Holds Barred, it's not the fun kind of terrible. It's painful to sit through. And who was this made for? It's extremely condescending to wrestling fans and makes them look like complete idiots, so of course they're not going to like it. And it's not going to appeal to general audiences either because the story is stupid and the comedy is awful. It was written by Stephen Brill, who also wrote the Adam Sandler vehicle Little Nicky and the critical and commercial flop Walk of Shame. And the comedy in this movie is no better. So let's see some examples of why Mr. Brill should not write comedy again. One of Jordy and Sean's regular customers is the old lady from The Wedding Singer who likes to watch wrestling, swears a lot, and wears tight leather clothing. Because old ladies don't normally do that sort of thing, you see. So it's funny! And at one point, our losers hitch a ride with a van full of nuns and lead them in a sing-along of Running with the Devil. Because nuns don't normally sing songs about the devil, you see. So it's funny. Also, they fart a lot. Because farting is funny. There are the farting nuns. And here's Sean singing along to a Britney Spears song. Because guys don't sing along to Britney Spears, you see. And oh my god, what a fucking hack. Ready to Rumble sucks. 
And much to the surprise of no one, it was a critical and commercial flop. It has a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes, and even with its relatively low budget of $24 million, not counting advertising, it only made about half that at the box office. Well, it's a movie about WCW from the year 2000. It's only appropriate that no one saw it and it lost a shit ton of money. If you still haven't seen this movie 17 years later, I encourage you to keep that streak going. And if you have, I feel your pain. But wait, there's more! Remember how the WWF took Zeus from No Holds Barred and actually put him on TV to feud with Hulk Hogan? And remember how stupid that was because their feud made no sense and Zeus couldn't wrestle for shit? Well, that's nothing compared to what WCW did with David Arquette. And we'll talk about that in part two.